Hello, and thank you for joining us here on The Neutral Zone. I am Phil Milani, joined as always by my trusty sidekick, my partner in crime. Really, the best way to describe this person is my everything. Of course, I'm talking about at Eric Dalala. Phil, good to see you. A busy off-season week. It is. Been very uh, busy around UC Health Training Center. A lot of uh, football players walking around the hallways, football players out on the field. Uh, It feels like things are starting to get back to normal a little bit. Yeah, that's right. It's nice. The season is uh, within reach, Phil. Yeah. You have been working from home a little bit, though, Eric, so I've missed you. I know. Yeah, the the tier system just (laughs) is committed to keeping us apart. It it keeps us apart, but it can't stop us from having a great show. This is going to be an excellent episode here. We'll hear from Cortland Sutton. A little bit uh, talking about his rehab. And then uh, we have a a nice little debate to get to here, Eric, uh, talking about with the addition of Pat Sertan, the second, do the Broncos now have the best secondary in the entire NFL? So some, uh, there's some other good secondaries out there, Eric, but felt like maybe that would be a good topic of conversation because let's just face it. When the Broncos picked Pat Sertan in the first round, we thought maybe that was uh, 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 not an area they would address considering how, how many moves they made in free agency. Now they bring in someone like Sertan. Okay, all of a sudden, are we talking about the best secondary in football, Eric? Some of us didn't see it coming, so you predicted it. we got to give you the, the credit for that. You, you knew it was coming. You knew Pat Sertan was the guy. I, you know, I, I set you up for that to just get a little praise. There. Yeah, you know, it's I kinda, okay. I just lofted that one up and you knocked it out of the park. <laughs> hey, I'll, uh, I'll give you the credit when it's due. So uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later on in the show. We'll also talk about what we've seen so far through the start of the offseason program here. Went through the rookie mini camp uh, uh, last weekend. And then now uh, the vets have re- joined up with the rookies out there all on the f- uh, field together at the same time. So we'll talk a little bit about that, Eric. But first, we have some emails to get to, you know, we like to make, we like to make this an interactive show. You know, this is about NZ nation. So we like it when you guys leave a voicemail 707 neutral. That's how you leave a voicemail. Just call up. We'll play it on the air. If you leave a voicemail, Eric, there's another way to do it. That's right. Phil neutral zone show at gmail.com. You could leave a nice little email right there. We'll read it on the air. Yeah, and uh, you know who took advantage of that was Andy Maines, Eric. He uh, sent in a couple of emails over the last couple of weeks, and we thought we'd uh, address them here a little bit. He's uh, uh, writing from Connecticut, so we like uh, we like our fans all across the U.S. Uh, paying attention to what's going on with the Broncos. He says, just wanted to comment on everybody putting Drew Locke down. The kid's only been in the league two years. I think Broncos country... Uh, needs to give this kid a break. And, uh, you know, he says everybody wants to see Aaron Rodgers in a, Dar- in a Denver uniform, but uh, he says, let's just wait a little bit here. Eric, what do you think about uh, the email that he was able to send in? Well, I think Andy Maines is the father of someone who used to work here, Andrew Maines' son. <laughs> Andrew Mason, huh? Yeah, so that uh, yeah. nice to see a little family connection there, Phil. That was bad, Eric. That was really bad. Usually... I'm the one who's making bad jokes. I think people will be able to appreciate it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can understand the frustration to some degree with Drew Locke, but uh, I think that, as we saw, Phil, there's a lot of uh, emphasis on his new footwork, apparently, based on some videos out of the Broncos' Phase 2 programming. He's uh, reportedly worked with Peyton Manning. He's got a chance here to uh, to take a step forward. He's only played in 18 games, so I think people do need to give him a fair shake in this competition against Teddy Bridgewater as we continue with OTAs and go into training camp. But, uh, Phil, I, I've said all along, and I still believe it, I think Drew has the higher upside of the two guys, and if he can get there, he'll win the job. It's just a matter of cutting down on some of those mistakes. But, yeah, I mean, w- one way or another, Phil, we're going to see things kind of work themselves out during this competition, and if Drew wins, I think people need to get behind him a little bit. Yeah. And, you know, he's been here working. He's got uh, all the guys here. You know, a lot of the wide receivers are here. Tight ends are all here. And, uh, you know, it's nice to see Drew working with those guys out on the field. And, you know, I think 
this time of year, there's so much optimism. So like you kind of have to guard against that because when you see him, you see him in the building, you talk to him a little bit, you feel positive energy. And uh, I think you like to see, see that, but you also got to guard against all this optimism right now. But uh, certainly I think you just need to give him a little bit more time. I think that this is really the first time with Pat Shermer here that he's had some sort of an off season program to go through. And hopefully, uh, you know, that leads to some positive results. All the rage, like you mentioned, Eric, was uh, talking about his footwork. You know, that's not something that you or I really paid too much attention to. But people said that now when he's uh, under center, his stance is a little bit different. So clearly he's working on things. He's trying to be better. He wants to be good. And everything that we've seen from him, he's willing to put in the work to be that. So let's just uh, see what happens here. Still a, a couple of months to go before training camp. That's when that competition is really going to fire up. And uh, then we'll get to see all of the, see if some of that work that Drew's put in, see if that translates out onto the field. Yeah. And then, you know, toward the end of last year, we kind of saw a little bit of that seven touchdowns, two interceptions over the final four games of the season, I believe. So he, he took some strides. And Phil, it's not under center that people are noticing, it's the shotgun stance. Shotgun. Was it a shotgun? I thought it was stance. his stance uh, at the uh, under the under center. I think it's when he's standing back there. People were saying it's oh. it's identical to Pete Manning, um, so that means he's going to throw fifty five touchdowns. Oh, well, maybe more since he gets an extra game. That's you know? true. Yeah, yeah. Well, I stop at fifty five. Yeah. Well, I was going to say he did look a lot more comfortable, like taking a snap from under center and dropping back and throwing a pass. So maybe uh, maybe all of it is just better, Eric. You know. I'll- uh, all important things as a quarterback to feel comfortable throwing passes. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Eric, uh, other ways that people can get involved in the show, they can hit us up on Twitter at Eric Delala with an A, at Phil Milani with a PH, non traditional spellings there. And then they could also uh, leave a comment if you're watching on YouTube, Eric. That's uh, one, one great way to get involved in the show. We love the YouTube comments, Phil. The one thing that I do that's part of my weekly routine now is Thursday morning, the show is posted to YouTube, and I just love to see what NZ Nation has to say. A lot of it is like hatred toward me. Um, That's what a lot of it is, but sometimes there's some nice comments in there too. You know, um, maybe they say something nice about my hair. I don't know. Yeah. It could be nice. Uh, Brad Delaney, though, uh, really took Pat Shermer to task last week. Eric. He, he left several comments, replies, and uh, he says, you guys think that offensive coordinator Pat Shermer, who's never coached a team to win more than seven games, is all of a sudden going to blossom. He says, maybe we can change the team name to the Denver Cherry Blossoms, because that's more likely than Shermer putting up eight wins. Wow. Whoa. Wow. I'm not sure. Does he know that Shermer is not the head coach? I don't know about that. I do like cherry blossoms, though. That's kind of a nice yeah. uh, little festival that they have going in Washington, D.C. sometimes. Yeah. I, I enjoy going out there. Um, I you don't see. quite understand necessarily. No. He left a lot of replies there. Um, and I think that he was just looking at maybe his head coaching record. Yeah, because was I asleep when Pat Shermer uh was in minnesota and they went to the playoffs or yeah or no. you, maybe you maybe you were sleeping i was yeah I was a maybe little you, tired maybe you were awake but uh, uh delaney here was he was yeah. sleeping i i also yeah. am pretty sure i mean i'm not like not a genius or anything phil but was pretty sure he was the qb coach with philadelphia when donovan McNabb led that team to a super bowl um a super bowl appearance not a super bowl victory Correct. He led them to yeah. the Super Bowl. Yeah. yeah. When you say led, led them to a Super Bowl, I think most people think that means a win. But mm. but it, it, this was just an appearance. I would say led them to a Super Bowl win, if that's what I was talking about. Oh, got him. Yeah. Got him, so. um, and I also believe, Phil, that in uh, his last, you know, excluding last year, the last seven seasons he'd been an offensive coordinator or head coach, they'd ranked in the top 20 in scoring. And so the results – have been there you know i guess this commenter is right that there haven't been any top five offensive performances out there but if you look at the quarterbacks he's worked with he also hasn't had like a 
a, a Tom Brady, a Russell Wilson, and Aaron Rodgers to work with. And so you know, he's made, for the most part, a, a decent amount out of the little that he's had to work with. And I think the hope is that if Drew, you know, look at when Drew played well against the Panthers, against the Raiders, um, a couple years ago against the Texans, obviously Shermer wasn't here at that point, but it's clear when Drew plays well, he can put up points. And so let's see what happens if maybe uh, Shermer can get things going a little bit. He's got his best weapon back with Cortland Sutton offensive line. Looks like it should be a strength if right tackle can be worked out. So I, uh, I understand that there's frustration around the entire offense, not just Drew Locke, but um, I don't know that saying he's never accomplished anything is, is fair. Yeah, so I mean, I get that there's frustration with the offense from last season, and people might put that on Pat Shermer, but I, I don't necessarily think that's fair. I, I think that people just really, um, unless you've been around it, I don't think that um, enough emphasis gets placed on the work that takes place in the off season. I mean, like what's happening right now, these guys are spending time in meeting rooms, they're installing things, and then the studying that goes on while you're out on the field, you know, you're working on very little things, you're working on the, all the details. They just didn't have time to do that last year. And I think that toward the end of the season, you mentioned that Drew was playing better. He was, uh, you know, not turning the ball over as much those final few games. And maybe it just took time to get to that point. Um, but I, I certainly say that the book is still out on Pat Shermer here in Denver. Yeah, I mean, I think, Phil, of certain situations where, you know, last year in L.A., Broncos drive the ball down the field, Pat Shermer calls a nice play, and Drew Locke makes a bad decision and throws an interception. That's not necessarily Pat Shermer's fault, but yeah. – the Broncos don't get the points associated with that possession. They end up losing the game. You know, their turnover margin goes down. So all of that sort of thing, it reflects poorly on Pat Shermer. And listen, I'm sure he would tell you that there's times where he could have called better plays or put people in better situations. But so much of last year, I think, Phil, so, was the kind of his head-scratching decisions. Mm. Um, and I do think, generally, there were some nice play calls to put guys in position to succeed. Um I hope that with Javante Williams and Melvin Gordon both able to pass block, that maybe the screen game opens up a little bit more. I think that that was somewhat limited last year, early in the year, because of Philip Lindsay's uh, restrictions and being able to block and catch the ball. So hopefully that adds to it. Get some screens going. Get Noah Fant going a little bit, Phil. We, I think if that if there's one thing that I would say that we need to see more of is it's when there's a dominant guy. We the Broncos need to stay with that. There were some halves where Noah Fant was really good, and then he just disappeared. I think uh, Pittsburgh, he didn't have a catch, I believe, in the first half, then played really well in the second half. Tennessee was the other way around, I believe. And so kind of sticking with the hot guy can be important. But, um, yeah, he, he's a veteran coach in this league, and I, I would expect them to improve this year. And I think in general for a lot of the offense, the pressure is on this year. You know, yep. like uh, I think that that uh, is true for Drew. That's certainly true for Shermer and just the whole offense with Melvin Gordon, with his contract, you know, for Corlin Sutton coming back from injury, just all these guys. I feel like there's a, it's time that all of the potential that we've been talking about for so long on the offensive side of the ball, we're ready to see that come to fruition. And, uh, you know, whatever has been the case the last couple of years, uh, you know, no offseason program, uh, just being young, those kind of things, those are all out the window now and it's time to execute. So. I think that it feels like uh, the pressure is on uh, the offense this year to really deliver on a lot of that potential. So uh, thank you, as always, uh, to Brad Delaney for those comments there and uh, all of the other commenters who uh, left the post uh, on our schedule show from last week. A lot of uh, record predictions, Eric. Uh, I did not see a 17-0, and 0, though, so I'm not sure I didn't see that. Well, it would be 20-0, and 0, I guess, with the postseason. Yeah. Yeah, I didn't see that either, but maybe oh, they're just okay. waiting to post that. Yeah. Yeah. I did see uh James Babcock says 12 and 5 easy. Okay. So I'll take that. I like that. Um uh Jay Slayer just simply said, I'm a huge Broncos fan. Huh. That's good. Good place, good place yeah. to be if you're a huge Broncos fan. There's Stephen H. Smith says we should be able to win 10 to 12 this year. Wow. 10, I think, is within uh, reach. 
Yeah. Which we'll have to see what happens. Yeah. Michael Jr., in my opinion, a solid 10 wins. Uh, Francisco Hernandez, that was cool. Hey, <laughs> thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. So, um, Broncos Batman also weighed in and said, great breakdown. Well, just, it, you know, you know. I, I would say, Phil, that at this point in the year, I try to be restrained a little bit and say, yeah, well, you know, it, it's a little, it's wishful thinking to think that you're going to get to 12 wins, 13 wins. If you're a fan though, you know, you should look at this point in the year and say, Hey, that's a win. We can win there. We can steal one here. That's what's fun about being a fan. You know, I, I don't think that there's any harm in being a little bit uh, excited and maybe overestimating the team. I mean, what, once you lose one, you lose one, but in the meantime, there's no harm in doing that. In the meantime, you're undefeated. Exactly. You know, yeah. that's my mindset. So. Broncos haven't lost to the Chiefs, Phil, this year. They have not. They have not. There's, there's always two sides to everything, you know, yeah. and I choose the, the optimistic side. Yeah. So anyway, thank you for all the YouTube comments. Uh, please keep them coming. We always appreciate that. And with that, Eric, let's get into our first topic here. And that's talking about the offseason program off and running so far. Like I mentioned, Drew Locke has been out here, but also a couple of guys who were injured last season, again, and a chance to see them out on the field. Guys like Cortland Sutton, Albert O, uh, really good to see. They've got huge knee braces on, but they're out there, Eric. Yeah, I believe I saw a photograph of a Sang Bassey taking part in some some stretching, maybe a couple of drills. So good good to see them. Um, Albert O and a Sang sounds like might not be ready for training camp based on what Vic Fangio said near the draft, but uh, we've seen some photographs and videos of Cortland running. He's got that brace on. I, I would imagine, Phil, at some point he's probably going to try to ditch that. But um, for now, smart to have the brace. Um, it, and, you know, it's voluntary. We've seen all these reports of players potentially staying away. I was really glad to see as many players that we've featured kind of in these videos, in these photographs. Um, you know, Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler, Tim Patrick. Those are guys that, you know, you talk about reps for Drew Locke, but if those guys aren't there, what does it really matter? You know, if Drew Locke is coming in and throwing routes to people that aren't going to be on the football team or aren't going to be out there when it's third and 10 and you need that completion in the fourth quarter, then some of that, you know, it, it's somewhat wasted. And so the fact that Jerry's there, KJ's there, Tim Patrick, uh, Cortland, obviously limited, but out there, that's big. Um, and then kind of my other takeaway, Phil, is just a great opportunity for the rookies to learn from guys like Von Miller, who we've seen, uh, be there. So if you're, a, you're Pat Sertan, you know, he might not play the same position as Von Miller, but to see his energy, uh, to see how he does things, I, I think that's important. Yeah. I was going to say my two big takeaways were on the offensive side of the ball, everybody being there, you're actually getting in some good work here. And then the other takeaway was just having Von Miller back out on the field. There's so much energy that he brings to the table. And I think that if you're a young guy and you see, okay, down the line, Von Miller is stretching there, you're like, okay, this is a future Hall of Famer I'm on the field with now, you know, and a, a veteran who's been at the highest level, when it makes it sort of feel more real that you're in the NFL now, you know, you're here and like a guy like Pat Sertan, you know, he's been a five-star recruit, he's gone through, you know, Alabama, won a national championship, and then now when you, now you're on the same field as Von Miller, maybe you're not the same level of stud anymore. You're like, Oh, that's Von Miller down there. You know, I, I still got a lot to work on here to get to that level. So, you know, uh, I think that there's just an energy and there's like a, a youthfulness that he brings. He keeps things light out there. Uh, you know, he uh, makes it fun. And I think that uh, just seeing him back out there, I mean, he looks like he's all full go right now, Eric, and that's gotta be encouraging. His quads look huge, which you got to love that, you know. Um, so, I, you know, I think that there's just a lot of energy out there. And, of course, optimism, like I was mentioning earlier, is it springs eternal right now. But uh, I think that there's a lot to be excited about. And it just feels good to be out there covering a practice. I'll tell you that. Yeah, and it'll be interesting, you know, once we get into OTAs and mini camp, and you can kind of see offense on defense, you get a better sense for – what's going on. My biggest question, or, you know, I don't know if it's a concern, but there's a chance that this offense could take a big step forward and still just 
you know, get absolutely shut down for periods mm-hmm. of time because of how good this defense is supposed to be. And so, you know, I'd still expect players to make their share of plays, you know, like Cortland Sutton making a catch in training camp or Melvin Gordon breaking a run or Noah Fant making a nice play. But I, uh, this offense, they're going to have to judge progress differently, I think, because when you get into those situations, Phil, and we're not quite there yet, but where you, you know, the move the ball drills or, you know, situational drills where it's, it's third and 10 and you got to get into field goal range, offense is going to have to understand that they they're going against perhaps the best defense in the league. And so you've got to, you know, you've got to take everything with a grain of salt. It's not going to be a situation where they're going to go out and succeed every time. And there's always a lot of back and forth in camp, but yeah, it should be good work for, you know, the Broncos. If you look at his team, the strongest units might be the secondary and the wide receiver. Real. Yep. So like those guys, are, and they're just going to make each other better during uh, some of these drills here. But uh, let's talk a little bit more about the offense, what you're saying there. Why do you think these guys all showed up? I mean, do you think that it's possible Drew, you know, like uh, showing some leadership skills here and said, hey, let's all let's all show up and get together. Or what, what do you make of that? Yeah, I don't, you know, it's hard to speculate. There's there's any number of reasons. Could be Drew, could be these guys just ready to get on the field after the way that last season ended and, you know, um, not wanting to miss any opportunities because phase one of the off season, you can, and we've seen some of the issues with guys getting hurt, but you can't essentially get the same work in, I would think, or pretty close to it either here or not here. But when you're into phase two and you're doing on-field work and you're doing drills with your teammates, if you want to get better, you've got to be here to do that. And so, you know, guys, some guys are choosing to come this week. Some guys might wait till OTAs. Some might wait till mandatory minicamp in a few weeks. But uh, I think around the league, Phil, you're seeing guys show up. And I, I haven't seen a team necessarily that's had a, a poor showing. I, I think guys are just, they understand that this is part of the deal. And then, Phil, you know, the wide receiver position might be a little bit different than, you know, some of these other groups. But if you're, uh, if you're competing for a job, you know, Alexander Johnson and Josie Jewell, for example, are both here this week. You can see the team take Baron Browning in the third round. and You know that Justin Cernan is coming back from an injury. You want to go out there and you want to show the coach, hey, I'm, I'm the guy, and, and not give them any opportunity to think, oh, well, maybe we should roll with somebody else. And so I do think there's some, some of this, um, you know, internal pressure to compete and, and be your best. Yeah, it- I just think that there's a general sense of people sick of the losing and frustration and that type of thing. And they, there's a gen, genuine commitment to wanting to get better. And I think that this is the time for the offense in particular, you know, from, from my point of view is just that they're getting really good work out there. And just in terms of just being around each other, you know, how many times last year did we say, God, it just doesn't seem like Drew Locke and Jerry Judy are on the same page. You know, well, some of those things get ironed out right now, you know, as crazy as it might seem. It's just that, you know, some of those things just get worked on some of the subtleties, some of the things that, you know, when you're in a game and you've repped it so many times that it just comes second nature. Those things are being installed right now. And uh, I just think uh, particularly at the wide receiver position, uh, I, I was not surprised to see everybody show up. I mean, literally everybody's here at that position. Corlin Sutton, uh, Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler, Tim Patrick, uh, obviously Seth Williams is here. Tyree Cleveland is here. These guys are all ready to work and get better and be on the same page here with Drew. And like you mentioned, you could be working out and lifting weights and running and doing those kind of things on your own, but get, catching passes from Drew Locke out there, whether you know it's it's at three quarter speed or whatever, it makes a difference. So I was encouraged to. Uh, see those guys show up. And one of the guys we mentioned is Cortland Sutton continuing to work his way back from a, an ACL tear that happened in week two last year against the Steelers. I had a chance to uh, catch up with him with, after one of these practices and uh, just hear about his mindset a little bit, talked about how frustrating it was to uh, watch last season and also uh, talked about the quarterback competition a little bit. So uh, here's my conversation with Cortland Sutton. Corlin, how does it feel to be back on this field, man? Man, you know, it's a, it's a blessing, you know. Um, when you take a step back and, uh, you know, you 
look at the big picture of everything. Um, you know, September really was like the last time I got to really run a route be around the boys and everything. So to be able to just do individual period with the boys, be able to coach them up a little bit while we were doing um, routes on there. Uh, you know, I told Drew, just being able to be back in the huddle, listen to him call a play, man. You know, it's the small things like that that um, you really enjoy even more so, you know, after something like that. You missed it, huh? Oh, man, big time, man. This is, you know, when you get to go do something like this, something that you're really good at, something you love, um, and you get to go back to it, and it's amazing. And then you get to do it with, you know, your boys, it's, it's amazing. I can't complain. I can't complain or, you know, find a different situation to be in. How hard was it watching at, uh, at the end of last year? I mean, you get hurt week two of the season. How hard was that? Uh, you know, it was tough. You know, obviously, you, um, you set goals for the season, things that you want to uh, accomplish um, individually and then also team goals. And, um, you know, when it, both of those get thrown out the window and, and now it's, you know, a whole different focus of, you know, now I got to rehab, now I got to get my knee right. Um, it, it just turns to a different focus. And it was tough, you know, watching the guys um, but it was also nice because I got to get a different perspective of the game and, and also get to, you know, coach the guys up from that other perspective that I was getting to watch the game from. So um, there was this pros and this cons and, uh, you know, I always try to find the positive and the negative. How does the need feel now? Uh, it feels really good, you know, um, to be where the, to be at the stage that I'm at right now um, post-surgery. Uh, and to be able to go out and do what I do and feel and, and it feels the way it does, you know, it, it gives me hope and promise for, you know, the future because um, I'm only going to continue to attack reha rehab as I have and um, even into the season and just continuing to make sure that, you know, I'm taking care of my temple, making sure that my body's right so I can go out and perform with, with the boys. How have you been attacking this? I mean, we've seen you around the facility almost every single day. Oh, man, attacking it with a 1% mindset. You know, every single day is uh, um, how can I get better at something? I don't know exactly what it's going to be yet, but I'm going to get better at something today. And um, I attack that. I, I keep that mindset, you know, from rehab to when I come on the field to go work, do my field work to the weight room. You know, all of these are opportunities to go out and get better with myself, really get my knee right so that I can um, come back and not have, you know, any thought while I'm out there playing. A normal off season, you go back home, you maybe take a little bit of time off. You've been here all the time, I mean, early mornings. I mean, how many hours, what's a day like for you? Uh, you know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, you know, I have pretty pretty full days, I would say. I uh, usually get up here around seven-ish. Um, and most of the time I'm done around two, for the most part, two or three, for the most part. So um, a little school day for the, <laughs> I got I got a little school day in hours, you know, when I'm when I come up here. But um, you know, I don't think about it in, in terms of the the hours that I spend up here. Um, you know, I get the chance to go do my rehab, get my knee right, get a chance to go on the field and work on that, and then I get a chance to go in the weight room and continue to fine tune that um, at that aspect of of my body. And um, you know, by the time I look up, it's one two o'clock, and you know. Um, haven't even thought about it, but I feel like when you when you take a mindset of um, how can I get, go into these situations and get better versus dang I have to be up here for this this X amount of time, then you get more out of it when you have that first mindset. So um, I've been enjoying it. You know, it's been really nice. It's an opportunity to do what you love. Exactly, exactly. Um, you know, uh, opportunity to go out here and get better, and you know, uh, physically, and then also you know get better as the skill of football. How hungry are you going to be now when you finally get back out there? Man, I'm hungry right now, man. You know, it's it's uh, you know, I have a pretty much a whole year that I didn't get to do much because the first game was hurt. Second game, I only played a half of football. So, um, you know, to be able to um, have all of that built up and then you know grinding every single day to get back to the spot and then some of how I feel with my body playing football. Um, you know, I'm. <laughs> <laughs> nipping at the bit, as people would say. <laughs> Is it hard to be like, man, I got to tone it down just a little bit here, otherwise I'm pushing it too hard? <laughs> it's funny, uh, the, trainers, the trainers are in the back of my ear always going, 80%, come on now, 80%, don't forget 80%, not yet, not yet. And um, I have to, you know, remind myself that we aren't fully all the way there yet um, and, take, and to continue to take these baby steps and continue to take these small wins as I did in the very beginning when, you know, I was learning how to walk again. So um, just continuing that mindset of that, that 1%. You know, you think you'll be ready for camp then? <laughs> That's the game plan. That's the game plan. <laughs> I love it. I know you're a leader in that wide receiver room. They bring in the young guys last year, Jerry, uh, KJ. You saw Tim take a big step. I mean, how good is this wide receiver room now? Man, you know, I think I think the sky's the limit for us. Uh, you know, we have weapons in every every category that you're looking for in speed, size, um, 
catching ability, route running. I feel like, you know, we, we're pretty versed in our room. And um, like I said, I'm, I was excited watching those dudes have the success that they had this past season. Um, and I'm even more excited to be able to be, you know, in there with them this upcoming season to have even more success and um, to help the team even, even more so. Uh, hard uh, going into things like this, though, with knowing that there's going to be a quarterback battle here. I mean, we saw Drew out here today. Uh, it seems like it's going to be an interesting 50 50 type of thing. Yeah, um, it's gonna be it's gonna be a, a, a good little battle. I think that uh, you know I, I always tell people competition brings the best out, and I'm pretty sure everybody's heard that before. And I think um, those guys are gonna push each other to make sure that the 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 best version of whichever quarterback comes out is ready to go out there and and, and you know win games. Awesome, Cortland. Hey, it was awesome seeing you out there, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. My thanks to uh, Cortland Sutton, a good chance there uh, to catch up and uh, check in to see what the Pro Bowl wide receiver has been up to. Eric, we've seen him around the facility uh, all throughout this offseason, and that's uh, part of the rehab process. When you're hurt, uh, when other guys are going off to Mexico or to Miami or wherever, uh, you're here. And that's something we saw Bradley Chubb do last offseason, and now we're seeing uh, – I guess it's unfortunate that so many guys got hurt, but that's what we're seeing from a lot of these guys right now. Yeah, and he's putting the work in, and he wants to get back, and you can tell how much he misses being out there on the field. And listen, Phil, a healthy Cortland Sutton changes everything for this team because it not only gives whoever is that quarterback an elite weapon, a Pro Bowl weapon, but it makes things easier for Jerry Judy, for KJ Hamler, for Tim Patrick, for Melvin Gordon, for Noah Fant. I mean – Sutton could be the most valuable player on this offense because of what he unlocks for everybody else. And, you know, yeah, I think it's possible that his, his stats could be worse this year, just because you've got Jerry Judy and you've got a more talented wide receiving core than the last time that Tim, or excuse me, that Cortland was the, the number one guy, but that doesn't mean he won't be a better player. And, you know, we'll just have to see what happens. It took Bradley Chubb a little bit of time to work back into things. Wouldn't surprise me to see the same thing with Cortland, even if he is, ready to go. I'm sure they'll manage him in a similarly cautious way, but uh, I mean, I would expect him to get in the end zone quite a bit this year as he's coming back. He mentioned that he wants to get to a point where he's not even thinking about that knee. He's obviously not there yet. And I think that it probably takes some time for a wide receiver who's cutting, putting a lot of pressure on that knee to have sudden change of direction. That's a little bit, that's a, that's a lot when you're running, full speed, and then all of a sudden you're changing direction. You're asking your knee to do a lot in that situation. I also liked how he t talked about the wide receiver room a little bit there, said that they've got a good combination of everything. You know, uh, they got size, they got speed, they've got the route running with Jerry Judy. I think that they really complement each other well. And, you know, uh, hopefully we get a chance to see all those guys in action this year because we talked so long about that last year, Eric, just about – this whole, all the weapons that they have, and then the injuries happen and everything. But hopefully, we get to see this thing come together a little bit. Yeah, and listen, I've said this many times: there will be injuries, but you just hope that they're not as extreme or not to as many guys or not to the core guys. Um, and it would be nice, Phil, to just see a few games of what does this thing look like when you've got Sutton and Judy and Hamler and Patrick and Fant and Melvin Gordon, and, and you're rolling. You know, that's what the goal is. That's what things are ideally going to be. And so, yeah, it would be really nice to, to get that for at least a while. Yeah. You know, think about the red zone situation, Eric, if Albert O is healthy and Cortland's healthy, Noah Fant is out there. I mean, you're talking about some legitimate size and, and guys who could just high point the ball box out, you know, situations like that where, Hey, it's third and two uh, and, and you got to get in the end zone. You, you got guys you could just throw the ball up to. It's good to, yeah. good to see that. So uh, my thanks to Cortland for uh, spending some time to chat. Uh, Eric, let's get into the main topic of conversation for today's episode, and that is do the Broncos have the best secondary in the NFL? Made a lot of additions this offseason, Eric. Added guys like Kyle Fuller, Ronald Darby, and now uh, you, they brought it back uh, Justin Simmons on a big deal. And now they drafted Pat Sertan. Is this the best secondary in all of football, Eric? Um, I don't know if I'm ready to say that quite yet, Phil. I think that it's a top 
three, top five group. Um, there are just some really good secondaries out there, you know, and I, I think looking at the cornerback position is probably where I say like this group is not quite at the elite level yet, just because, I mean, Pat Sertain is a great pick, but he's got to, he's got to go prove it. Ron Darby has played really well at times, but he's got to stay healthy. Bryce Callahan is a really good player, but he's got to stay healthy. Kyle Fuller took a step back last year. He's got to, you know, take a step forward again and got to show that, you know, kind of where he's at in his career that he can still play at a high level. And so I think it's possible that they get there and they've got to gel, but, you know, I don't necessarily think about this group quite yet in the same, you know, category as like a no fly zone, for example. And so, and I know that we're talking about currently, but I, I think about like, that's what it took to be the best secondary in the NFL then. So I don't think they're quite, in that range yet, but they do have the potential to get there. Who are, who are some of your top, top secondaries in the NFL, Eric, who are some of the teams that you think at this point are ahead of the Broncos? Yeah. I mean, I think overall, you know, like Pittsburgh has a good secondary, the Los Angeles Rams had a good secondary. Uh, I think of Washington, they added to their cornerback group. And, and that's maybe where I look is like, the Ravens have a really good cornerback group. Washington has a good cornerback group. New England has a good cornerback group. So Miami, you know, like Xavier Howard, Byron Jones, like those are two good players. I do think having a safety tandem like Justin Simmons and Kareem Jackson puts you back in the conversation and maybe a little bit higher than you would be otherwise. Um, but there, there are just a few groups out there that I think um, they've proven it maybe, you know, like a, a Marcus Peters and a, uh, Marlon Humphrey, they've got the Pro Bowls to show for it. And I think that this group just needs to, they've got the potential to be the best, but maybe need to show it on the field first before I'm just going to declare them number one. Yeah. I mean, certainly on paper, they're promising. I, I would say they're probably like uh, the fifth best uh, group uh, after taking a look uh, at some of these uh, units around the league. Part of it is got to just sort of gel and be able to play well together as a unit. Um, you know, and just have a good feel for, you know, where guys are, see how that you complement each other. But on paper, I do think that they have the opportunity to to move up to that top spot. I mean, you're talking about a guy like Kyle Fuller, a two time pro bowler, 19 career interceptions. This guy's a ball hawk. He he makes big hits out there on the field and he's had his best season ever under Vic Fangio. So on paper, I think you're promi- you should. You should feel some uh, promise there. Uh, Ronald Darby, uh, excellent cover guy, only allowed one touchdown last year. Uh, when Bryce Callahan is healthy, we've seen him play at a really high level. Only played in 10 games last year, but was able to have two interceptions, a, a fumble recovery. Uh, and then you add in Pat Sertan, who is the SEC Defensive Player of the Year, first-team All-American guy. You know, one of the things that I don't like to do is, like, look at like rookie mini camp and be like, Oh, this guy looks like he's going to be really good. But one of the things you can do, I think is say, how does this guy compare to some of the other guys who are on the field with him? You know, the Broncos drafted some other guys in the secondary, uh, Kerry Vincent, uh, they drafted uh, Jamar Johnson, Caden Stearns. When you see Pat Sertan on the field, he looks a little bit different than those guys do. He, he looks big. He's got a presence to him, but he also looks really smooth. What did you say? Is that, is that, do you think that's fair to say about? Yeah. Smooth. I think he looks like he's built for the NFL. You know, like some of these guys come in and you can tell like, Hey, he's got to get bigger. He's got to do this. And I think that, you know, Sertan can probably get more in NFL shape, but he, he looks like he's ready to go. Like you could put him out there today um, and Phil, I think with him, I wouldn't be surprised just based on what he's done in college, his film, if he's the best corner on the field by midseason. And I mean, he played a lot as a freshman at, at Alabama. So, yeah. you know, uh, it, he, he doesn't have a problem making a jump to a new level of competition. And I, I don't want to jump to any conclusions about him or anything. All I'll say is he just looks different than some of the other guys that were out there during rookie minicamp. And I don't think that's a knock on the other guys. I think that's just a, a positive about Sertan. Just looks smooth is the way I think that's a lot, how, how a lot of people have described him. It's just, he kind of like floats on the grass, Eric. Yeah. 
you know, so, and then, so, th- so th- that's a look at the Broncos defensive backs. But then if you look at a safety position that I think they might have the best tandem there in Kareem Jackson and, and Justin Simmons. Safeties so, are defensive backs too, Phil. Uh, cornerbacks and safety. Sorry. That's what I, uh, that's what I meant. Yeah, no, I, I do think they're one of the best duos. They complement each other. Well, and I think the fact that you added some much needed depth, Jamar Johnson and Caden Stearns is important. Um, and Trey Marshall, obviously going to fight for a roster spot too. It, it's interesting. It's all dependent to me on does Kareem keep up his level of play? He played really, really well in 2019. And I thought, you know, well, Hey, there's a chance he's going to take a step back in 2020. And I thought he played well again. Yeah. And, and he kind played of, all 16 games, you know, exactly. so that's important too. But he's just kind of, you know, he's fighting father time here at some point. And um, based on the speed with which he plays the game, the physicality, at at some point he's going to take a step back. And so it's just a matter of when that happens. If he can stay the same Kareem Jackson that we see, you know, blowing plays up at the line of scrimmage, then this secondary is going to be really, really good. Um, and, And I don't have many questions about him based on how he looked toward the end of last year. Like, it's not like he fell off a cliff toward the yeah. end of the season or anything. Um, so, yeah, I mean, in terms of safety positions, I don't know if I would say Justin is the best safety individually in the game, but when you pair him with Kareem Jackson, I think as a duo, they're probably the best one. Yeah, I mean, Justin Simmons is that free-range kind of center fielder guy, five interceptions last season, and then Kareem is the guy who brings that physical element Together, they really play well together. Kareem is heading into his 12th season in the NFL. So that's uh, that's a lot for a safety, uh, a cornerback, uh, how Kareem has played uh, all throughout the NFL here throughout his career. So, But he did play in all 16 games last season. And, Eric, uh, you mentioned the depth. That's something that's really bitten the Broncos a little bit the last couple of years is that down the stretch of the season, they just didn't have that depth. Uh, but now that doesn't seem like – after the thing, things they did in the draft, Caden Stearns, Jamar Johnson, you feel like uh, they have some depth at safety. And then uh, at uh, cornerback, they still have the same Bassey. Not sure when he'll be available, but, you know, he he played a lot of valuable minutes last year. Michael Ojemudia, uh, Duke Dawson, they brought in Terry Vincent Jr. So they have some depth now at some of these spots, and that'll certainly help on special teams for sure. But also these guys should be available to step in in case there's any injury. So, yeah, I'm, I mean, I look back, Phil, I can't even remember the name necessarily, but the Broncos signed somebody the week ahead of the Browns game and he punched somebody and got thrown out of the game and the Broncos were down to like two available cornerbacks on the <laughs> yes. field or something, maybe one. It, I don't think that that should be an issue this year, even if, you know, you've got essentially four, what I would consider elite guys in Sertan, Callahan, Darby, and Fuller. And, you know, you're going to have to find a way to get those guys all on the field or, you know, someone you're going to have a really good player watching. Um, and then I think at the next level, you know, think of a guy like Michael Ojemudia, who last year started a bunch of games for the Broncos and is now going to be battling for like the fifth corner position, maybe. And you normally keep six. So um, that should show you the depth is that you've, he's gone from, I think in that Falcons game, Phil, he was probably the number one cornerback that the Broncos had available. And now he's the fifth guy. And so that, that speaks to what they've done with this group. But yeah, to me, the problem won't be depth. It's can you find a way to keep most of these guys? Can you find a way to stash certain guys on the practice squad? So if that you need them later in the year, they know your, they know your system and they're ready to go, but yeah, they've got, they've got good depth at nickel with Callahan, Bassey, and Kerry Vincent, they've got good depth on the outside with Duke Dawson, with uh, Michael Ojemudia, Parnell Motley they kept. So, I mean, there's some there's some good players here that are going to be on the outside looking in, but that's good. That's what you want. And I, I think finally, Phil, for the first time in a while, if you look around, not just at the cornerback position, but the Broncos really didn't have a glaring hole where you like where you were like, they need a starter right now. You know, and I know people will say, well, quarterback, and we'll see what happens there. But for the last few years, you know, you've had to take an outside linebacker. You've had to take a a left tackle or you've had to take a wide receiver. You know, you you just needed those guys. Whereas I feel like finally the depth has been replenished a little bit by the last 
since 2018, really, because those 2016 and 2017 drafts hurt in a way where you just didn't have that depth. You're back to it now. You can add just kind of best player available and, and build your team up and, and kind of raise all boats. And I think that's where they are. Yeah. Now, if you want to take a look at some of the other secondaries around the NFL in relation to what we just went over, the Rams obviously ha- are loaded back there. New defensive coordinator, though, with Brandon Staley leaving, but Jalen Ramsey, Darius Williams, he had four interceptions last year. John Johnson, uh, they, they're they loaded there. They didn't lose Troy Hill, but uh, they obviously have a, a lot of talented players. You mentioned the Ravens, Marlon Humphrey, Marcus uh, Peters. John Johnson isn't on the Rams anymore. He signed with oh, the Browns. He, oh, so, and uh, Troy Hill went there too, right? Uh, I'm not sure about Troy Hill. Troy Hill, I think, went to the Browns. Troy Hill went to the Browns. You're correct. Yeah, the Browns are yeah. going to have a nice little secondary. They also drafted. They got John Johnson guys. too, huh? Yeah. Man, I missed that one. Okay. So never mind. Maybe the Rams aren't as good as the Broncos. <laughs> Take that back. But the Ravens definitely are loaded. Uh, Marlon Humphrey, Marcus Peters, Jimmy Smith, CU grad. So that's nice there. The Packers have a nice secondary with uh, Jair Alexander, a pro bowler. Only two touchdowns allowed last year. Adrian Amos, they got a nice secondary there too. And then the Steelers, obviously, with uh, Joe Hayden and Minka Fitzpatrick. Minka Fitzpatrick might be the best safety in all of football. Um, just a, a, an all pro the last two years. So uh, I do think yeah. that uh, uh, this, those, those teams are probably ahead of the Broncos right now. I mean, this is not a uh, – I mean, Buffalo's got a pretty good secondary, too, up there with Tredavious White. You know, they've got some good players. Uh, Poyer, um, Tyron Matthew, to me, Phil, is, is still the best safety in football. You think um, he's better than Minka? I do. I, hmm. I do. Uh, I think he's, he's, he scares I think me he a little bit. Like oh, really? Yeah. The honey badger scares you, huh? Do they still he, call him the honey badger? I think he picked off Drew Locke twice last year in one game, right? Um, I think, both yeah. of, I think both of his interceptions were to Matthew. Because he, I know that Matthew had that big interception over Corlin Sutton in the snow game. Um, well, that was just a PBU, not an interception. You know, oh, Tough. oh, Corlin had the ball. He was going to score a touchdown, and then he knocked yeah. it away. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah, the Broncos, I know according to I know yeah, according to you, the Broncos things. have a keep to leave in the secondary. So they're. they're I miss the John Johnson move. Thing. Yeah, I feel kind of bad about that. I should. Uh, those are things that I I should know. And that's, okay. um, that's why that's why we're here for each other. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, I mean, I th- I think that the best way to put it is this: there are probably teams with more elite players at corner than the Broncos. But as a but, unit, though, Eric, that's what I'm I, talking about. Right. But that's what I'm saying is that there are probably teams that have a better number one corner than the Broncos. Sure. But, but as a collective, I do think the Broncos are right in that conversation of, hey, there's not a big drop off from Darby to Fuller to Callahan. Those are all really good players that would would really start probably on almost any team. And so that it's a very consistent group that with if its potential is realized, could take that next step. Eric, that might, that's a perfect example of why maybe they went ahead and drafted a guy like Sertan. You know, you mentioned the elite highest level type of cornerback that's out there in the game, Xavier Howard, somebody like that. Uh, no knock on Fuller or anything, but those guys, they're not quite at that level. So maybe that's why you go out and get a Sertan who eventually you hope can turn into one of those guys. Right. And like I was saying earlier, I think that that will happen sooner rather than later he seems like a guy that's ready to go he's ready to go huh Eric? he's kind of like you yeah Yeah. i stay going so i don't have to get going yeah yeah that's that's a really good philosophy to have (laughs) in my opinion uh anything else you want to say about secondary sir no i mean i just i think that they're in a good spot and they you know they should help bradley chubb and von miller get to these guys hopefully similarly having Bradley Chubb and Vaughn Miller and Shelby Harris and Draymond Jones. Hopefully those guys get some pressure on the quarterback and give these corners and these safeties a chance to make game-changing plays. Um, If there is one thing, Phil, that I think this group, this cornerback group does better than 
maybe any of them since the no fly zone was here is they get that their hands on the ball and they they intercept mm-hmm. passes and mm-hmm. uh, I mean there were times last year where AJ Boye played well and obviously that was a limited stretch but due to injuries and there were times when um, you know Michael Ojemudia played okay but th- they didn't get those interceptions that they needed Bryce Callahan was really the only guy at corner that was able to do that and so they need they need more of that and I just hope that you know, in today's NFL, Phil, you're going to get thrown on. They're going to move the ball at times. You hope not to get beat up too bad. But to me, what makes a really good secondary is those those game changing plays, those pick sixes, those mm-hmm. uh, key interceptions. And so that's what I'll be looking for in training camp early in the year. Is you know, can you go down to uh, MetLife Stadium and force Daniel Jones into some mistakes? And to me, that's what's going to be the difference between being a, a good defense and a, and a really elite one. And they have a completely different personality too than the no fly zone. The, similarly, they like to get their hands on the ball, but these guys, they don't, they're not as a uh, uh, boisterous out there, you know, like Pat, Pat Sertan is a pretty quiet guy. Fuller definitely was really quiet, a uh, different attitude uh, from this unit here. Eric, we mentioned earlier that the offense has a lot of pressure on them to have that potential become realized out on the field. I think in a different way, there's a lot of pressure on this defense now to not just be good, but be elite. Like you mentioned, make those game changing plays that this defense, the way that it's stacked up, the way that they've uh, invested so much in it this off season, they can't afford to just be average or pretty good. This has to be an elite level defense where the Broncos are winning games because of, because of this side of the ball. Yeah, I agree. And I mean, especially with as many veteran players as you have picking up Von Miller's option, re-signing Justin Simmons, re-signing Shelby Harris, that's the expectation. They've got to be worthy of those those deals that they got, of being the big ticket guys that they are. So it'll be interesting to watch that, you know, kind of in, you've got the offense growing up and I think people expect that to take a little bit of time still. And, um, you know, they want to see more, but they're a little understanding. People are going to want to see this defense play well from the get-go. If it all comes together, Eric, if the defense is top three, if the offense just gets it going, watch out. Watch out. That's true. With the Super Bowls in L.A., right, Eric? Uh, yeah, I got my ticket. So Yeah. yeah. I think that uh, we're staying at the same hotel. I think so, yeah. Adjoining yeah. rooms. Just so we can... <laughs> That's all right. Yeah. Pod right there. <laughs> pod, pod through the door right there. Exactly. Yeah. That, that's how I prefer to do it. Yeah. Man, I can't wait. I can't wait. Yeah. It's been a long time. Yeah. Yeah. Eric, uh, let's get to our favorite part of the show. That is shout outs. Eric, who are you shouting out this week? Well, I don't know if we shout out Liz Manis or not. She's probably, I think she's on a quote honeymoon. So probably not listening to the neutral zone though i what? can't really i can't really think of a better way to spend your honeymoon than listening to us i don't think that she'll miss an episode of the neutral zone got it well in that case shout out liz manis yeah she was not doing any zooming though last oh week. no zooming yeah. no zooming Tough. so but just shout out i guess just yeah. shout out. yeah and also congratulations again I think one cred- congratulations is probably enough. For me. You're cutting it off. You said last yeah. week was that was good enough. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was also going to say a shout out to uh, the Broncos coaching staff uh, earlier this week. They spent some time with uh, Colorado high school coaches over Zoom virtually, had a chance to uh, share some of their wisdom, share some of their drills, uh, some of the things that they like to uh, do to build culture and uh, giving it back to the high school level. And I think uh, Vic Fangio at one point said something along the lines of, uh, hey, all Denver Broncos players, all players in the NFL were one time high school players. So don't be afraid to challenge these guys. They're capable of more than you think. You know, uh, don't try to uh, minimize what they're able to do and uh, really, really, uh, you know, push these guys and see if they're uh, they can realize their potential and. Uh, I thought that was a good message there from Vic Fangio to some of the high school coaches in Colorado. Definitely. Maybe one other shout out, Phil, the Broncos announced they've hired Kelly Klein 
She's the executive director of football ops and special advisor to the GM. So she's the highest ranking woman in scouting in NFL history. Um, talk to her and she kind of, she said, Hey, I appreciate all the, the kind words and all the support, but she said, I hope somebody else passes me up soon. Women belong in football. Obviously we wholeheartedly agree with that. And, um, you know, she's put the work in to get to this point, Phil. It'll be interesting to, to watch her here in Denver. And it wouldn't surprise me if you know, five, 10 years from now, we're talking about, hey, Kelly Klein as a GM candidate, uh, which would be really, really cool. Most definitely. And I think that George Payton put out a statement and said that she's a rising star in the industry. And we've already seen her out at the practice fields. Uh, she said that she hit the ground rolling and uh, they already got this thing going. I've seen, seen her in the building a lot here. And uh, really cool to be able to uh, uh, bring her in and have her be a, a valuable part of the organization. I mean, uh, I think that no matter what, Eric, having uh, different viewpoints, having a, a diverse room helps in no matter what the field is. And uh, whether that's a, a personnel room in the NFL or um, any kind of executive office anywhere uh, in, a, in the world, having different viewpoints, having people of seeing the world differently, growing up in different situations, always will make a, a room stronger and make, you know, sometimes you're making decisions here where you're just judging players to come in and be a part of your organization. Uh, trying to have a different viewpoint on anything there is going to be a positive. So uh, it's cool to see her uh, be a part of uh, the Broncos organization now. And obviously it tells you what George Payton thought of her working right alongside her there in Minnesota. Yeah, most definitely. So uh, cool to see that. So Eric, anything else you want to talk about? No, I don't think so. Okay. Well, as always, we like to uh, encourage NZ Nation, the listeners of our podcast, to get in touch, be a part of the show with us. 707 Neutral, leave a voicemail. We'll play it right here on the air. Uh, Eric, what's the other way people do that? You can leave an email at neutralzoneshow at gmail.com. Also hit us up on Twitter at Eric Delala with an A, at Phil Milani with a PH, non-traditional spellings there. Or go ahead and leave a, a comment here on the YouTube page and smash that subscribe button. Just boop, 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 smash that. So uh, that's going to do it for this episode of the Neutral Zone. Uh, once again, thank you to Corlin Sutton for spending some time here uh, talking about his rehab process. We'll be back next week, but until then, for Eric Galala, I am Phil Milani. You've been listening to The Neutral, the Neutral Zone. Zone.